to welcome you, and uh, we're incredibly excited that you're with us today. Uh, man, I got to tell you, not only am I excited about today's message, uh, but I'm excited about what God's doing in the life of our church and how he's been moving in uh, each and every one of your lives. It's been great to hear the testimonies about how many of you are using what God has been speaking to you over these last couple of months together as we've been studying here in the book of James. If you haven't been with us, we started this series, and man, it seems like it was almost eight months ago. It hasn't been that long, but it feels that way uh, because COVID-19 has been going on, that pandemic that all of us are still kind of dealing with on a consistent basis. Uh, but we dived into the book of James, and we entitled it, A Faith That Works When the Pressure's On, because all of us have pressure in our life. And we've been looking at how when we find ourselves in the middle of a pandemic, there are different pressures that we begin to deal with, and those pressures cause us to react in different ways. If you don't believe that, all you got to do is talk to a counselor, talk to a pastor, somebody who's been doing counseling in, in uh, recent months, and the stress level of most everyone is through the roof. Uh, you don't believe that, drive down the road, drive slow, and watch how many universal signs you see as you drive down 23rd Street. It's pretty obvious that people are on edge. It's amazing to me how so many of us are struggling in different ways. And, uh, you know, anytime you find yourself with this kind of stress, uh, you begin to ask, how do you act and, and what kind of faith do you have that enables you to be able to face the pressures that so many of us are under? And so today we come to a place where we're going to look at this idea of relationships. We've been talking about that. We talked about last week how to stop quarreling. Uh, this week we're going to talk about how to stop, uh, to how to have a faith that keeps me from becoming or being judgmental of others. If you remember when this started, I told you that only your doctor can keep you from getting COVID. Uh, they're the only one that knows how to do that. I'm not a doctor. I can't do that. But as your pastor, the one thing that I can do is to help you cope with the stress and the emotional pressure that you're feeling. And that's what we've been trying to do is we've been looking at this together because what happens when you get under stress is there becomes pressure in the relationships that you have. Think about it just for a moment. I mean, I don't know about you, but many of us are tired and fatigued. Uh, we're under long-term stress and we're trying to figure out how do I move forward and how do I keep doing the things that are essential in my life? And anytime you're under long-term stress, what begins to happen is we become uh, touchy, we become rude, we become demanding, and we become judgmental of others. And so I love that James, right here in James chapter 4, talks very specifically about when you get under stress, how you can't be judgmental of other people. Now, when I use the word judgmental, what am I saying? Judging someone is rendering a verdict upon that individual. It's you looking at them and saying, well, based on the clothes they're wearing, the car they're driving, they probably have made certain decisions in their life. That's judgmental. It's looking at an individual based on the color of their skin and making a judgment call about who they are without even knowing them. It's looking at somebody maybe because they're from uh, a different, uh, I guess you could say, part of the world. And you make a judgment that maybe based on the color of their skin and based on the clothes that they're wearing, they're a terrorist, right? And so you say, all right, I'm going to make a judgment call about this person. That's judgmental. That's, that, that's you making a judgment call about somebody that you have no idea about. So James chapter 4, verse 11 through 12, he comes and he tells us specifically about this. I want you to listen to what he says. He says, brothers and sisters never say bad things about each other. Now, he's talking to believers. For those of you that are not followers of Christ, uh, he, he's not talking to you. He's talking to those of us who are followers of Jesus, who proclaim to be Christians. And James is saying, uh, you know, never say bad things about each other. Anytime you speak against fellow believers or you judge and badmouth them, you judge and condemn God's law. Then he goes on and says, and when you judge God's law, you aren't keeping it yourself. Instead, you set yourself up as the judge. Remember, God is the only true lawgiver and judge. He alone has the authority to save or to destroy. So then who are you? And what gives you the right to pass judgment on others? You see, what James is saying to us is, is why do you look at other people and make a judgment call about who they are and about their lives? And I think that the reason that happens is that anytime we're under long-term stress, we begin to be touchy and rude and demanding and even judgmental of other people. 
And we have to fight against that. We have to do everything we can to not uh, become that person, to do the thing that James says that we're not supposed to do. So we're going to answer three questions today very quickly. The first question we're going to ask is this. Why are we so quick to judge others? I think there's a reason behind it, and we're going to talk about that for a few moments. The second question we're going to answer is, why should I not judge others? Because James tells us three reasons that we should not judge other people. And then we're going to close out, and I'm just simply going to answer this question. How can I learn not, or how can I learn to be less judgmental? Because some of us need to learn that. We need to learn how to be less judgmental of other people and individuals. The first question we're going to begin with is, why are we so quick to judge others? And I think there's two things that James says here. The first one that you can write down is this. The first reason we're quick to judge others is simply because of guilt. We want to excuse our own failures. You see, it's easy for me to point a finger at you uh, because it makes me feel better about the guilt that I have in my own life, about decisions or things that I have done personally. And so anytime you begin to judge somebody, you have to understand that oftentimes it's because you want to excuse your own failures and your own mishaps. In fact, think about it just for a second. If you're not familiar with the story, you go all the way back to the book of Genesis in the very beginning, and Adam and Eve, when they sinned against God, the first thing that Adam did is he tried to make an excuse for the decision that he had made, and he tried to accuse Eve, remember? Uh, I mean, he immediately made an excuse. It's her fault. She's the one that caused me to do it, and he's accusing her, right? He's blaming her for it, and ever since then, I think man has a tendency to do that. Well, God, it was her fault. You know, she's the one that caused me to to do that, or she's the one that caused me to, to act in the way that I've acted. You see, we make excuses for our own behavior, and we, excuse, or we accuse others of something worse. In Romans chapter 2, verse 3, it says this, When you, a mere human, pass judgment on others, do you think that by pointing your finger at others, you will distract God from seeing all your misdoings and keep him from judging you? I mean, that's exactly what Adam tried to do. He thought by blaming Eve that he would be able to be excused for the bad judgment call that he had made in his own life. And the same thing happens to you and it happens to me. We get up under guilt and what do we do? We begin to judge other people. We begin to say, you know what? It'll just make me feel better. But let me remind you of the old childhood saying, when you point your finger at someone, there are three pointing back at you to remind you that you aren't perfect either and that you don't have it all together. And so the first thing we do is we judge because uh, of guilt. The second thing I think that happens is this. It's pride. Before we move to pride, let me just say this. I wrote this in my notes today, and I think it's important to say this in the middle of an election. And listen, I'm not going to get political. I just want you to hear what I'm saying. You see, politicians are great at this. They blame each other. They point their fingers. And let me tell you what that is. It's just diversion and cover-up. That's all it is. Nobody's wanting to take responsibility for their own personal sin, for their own problems, for their own mistakes or their own difficulties. And you see, we judge others because we want to get the guilt off of ourselves. And if I can put it on somebody else, whether it's a politician, a political party, whatever it is, if I can place the blame somewhere else, it just makes me feel better. And hopefully it makes me look better. But the reality is that's not true. The second reason that we judge is because of pride. Pride. We want to feel superior to other people. And so pride creeps into our life. And all of a sudden we, we begin to feel better about ourselves. You see, I want to tell you something today, and I think this is important. And, and, you know, you may want to write this down and just think about this later. Just contemplate on this statement. When you see someone who is always criticizing, when they're always judging and they're trash talking and they're talking bad about other people, let me just tell you something about that individual. They're insecure on the inside. You see, that's the reason. It's pride. Because of their insecurity and their pridefulness, They're just going to be uh, judgmental of other people. They're constantly going to be criticizing and trash-talking other individuals. In Job chapter 9, verse uh, I'm sorry, 19, verse 5, you are trying to make yourselves look better than me by using my disgrace as an argument against me. Job speaking about the people that were judging him. You see, they were trying to make themselves look better by 
tearing Job down. And isn't that what we do? We try to make ourselves look better by tearing someone else up. Hey, look at their sin. Look at their problems. Look at the bad decisions they're making. Look at the way they're mishandling their life. And as long as we can make, uh, make ourselves feel good, we'll, we'll do that. We'll make a judgment call about them. So why do we judge other people? Well, two things, guilt and pride. Those are the two very reasons that we, may, we, we become judgmental of others. Now, here's the thing we've got to ask. Why should I not judge others? Because James gives three reasons we shouldn't be judging one another. He says, you don't need to be judging other Christians, other believers. And you definitely don't need to be judgmental towards people who are outside the church because what does that say about us as Christians? And you hear people say this all the time. They can be some of the most judgmental people. Judgment is rendering a verdict. It's calling someone guilty when they're not guilty. It's saying that something's wrong when maybe you don't know the whole situation. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So why does the Bible say, or why does James tell us specifically here in James chapter 4 that we should not judge other people? There are three reasons. The first reason he gives us is this. He says, don't judge others because it is unloving. It is unloving. It's the most unloving thing that you can do. It's unloving. You can't love someone and judge them at the same time. Now, some of you are sitting there and you're going, well, I know scriptures where it says that I should judge. Stay with me just for a moment because we're going to talk about this. Let me tell you something. You can't even judge yourself because you don't even know your own heart. The Bible says that. A man doesn't even know his own heart. So how can you be judging somebody else when you don't even know your own heart personally? In fact, James chapter 2, verse 8, he put it this way. He says, the royal law found in Scripture is love your neighbor as you love yourself, and if you obey this law, you do the right thing. He says, basically, when you're judging others, you're being unloving. What, what, what does that mean? You're breaking the greatest commandment that was given to us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, I'm smart enough to know the answer to this question. You don't have to shake your head. You don't have to poke the person next to you. I know what you would probably say. How do you want people to treat you? You don't want somebody to judge you. You don't like being judged by others. And so we're to do unto others as we would have them do unto ourselves. We're to love people in the same way that we want to be loved. And the most unloving thing that we can do is to be judgmental about another person and about their life. You see, James chapter 4, verse 11 says it this way. He says, anytime you speak against fellow believers or you judge or badmouth them, you judge and condemn God's law. What he's saying is, is that you're saying that the law that God gave us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves is not important. And, and we're basically saying, hey, we're, and we're condemning God's law. We're saying, God, it's not important. I'm going to make a judgment about them. Uh, it doesn't matter because even though I know it's unloving, I'm going to do it anyways. I heard a story one time of a lady who came to her pastor and she said, Pastor, I have the gift of criticism. He looks at her and he says, I don't think that there's a spiritual gift called criticism. He said, now, what it may be is a talent. He said, maybe you're talented at criticizing others. He said, but let me tell you what Jesus said. You need to go and bury that talent. That's what you need to do with it. You see, we become so critical of other people. You ever met somebody like that? They're just constantly criticizing. They constantly can find fault. They constantly see the wrong in others. And, and we shouldn't be that way because when we're that way, we're being unloving. It, now, I'm not talking about speaking truth. I'm not talking about calling things the way they are. That's not at all what I'm saying here. I'm saying judgment. It's rendering a verdict about somebody. It's making a judgment about that individual. So judging others is unloving, but then secondly, James tells us this. He says, judging others is God's job, not mine. Now I'm thankful for that. I, I, I gotta tell you, the one thing that I'm thankful for is that this is God's job. This is the thing that he's going to do. It's not my job to judge anyone. In, in fact, James tells us this. Here's how he put it. He says, remember, God is the only true lawgiver and judge. We'll come back to that word lawgiver. He alone has the authority to save or to destroy. So then who are you and what gives you or, or gives uh, you the right to pass judgment on others? So James asks us, he, he says, let me just ask you a question. Uh, first, remember that God is the only true lawgiver. Did you know the word lawgiver? I looked it up this week. I think it's only used five times in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
It's only used one time, particularly in this uh, in the New Testament. This is it right here, uh, the, the, this, this Greek word lawgiver. And what it means is this. God is the only true lawgiver and judge. No one else. He's the only one that can judge. He's the only one that gives the law. It's God. So he, therefore, as the giver of the law, he is the one that judges and upholds the law, right? And that's what James is trying to get us to see. Remember that God is the only true one who does what? Who gives the law. Anytime I judge other people, guess what I'm doing? And this is the bottom line today, really. Anytime you judge somebody else, you're playing God. Every time you look at somebody and you make a judgment call about their life, you make a judgment call about them as an individual, you make a judgment call about choices and decisions that they're making, you're playing God. You have put yourself in God's place as the lawgiver and the ultimate judge. And so he tells us, he says, don't do that. In Romans chapter 4, 14, verse 4, he says, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him, uh, to make him stand. Now, when I read that and, and I thought about what the Apostle Paul was saying, Paul was just saying this. He says, if you look at, Marty, if you look at and you judge someone else, God says to me, Marty, they are not your servant. They are my servant. You have no right to judge them. And so he tells us, he says, judging others is unloving. Judging others is God's job, not mine. But then notice this, number three, judging others is unchristian. It's unchristian. Now, how, how can I say that? Well, very simply because John tells us this, James points this out. As Christians, we are to be like Christ. And it's important to understand that, that we're to live our lives as Jesus led his life. And if you look at John chapter 3, verse 17, listen to what it says. It says, God did not send his son into the world to judge the world guilty, but to save the world through him. I was contemplating that this week, and, and I was thinking to myself, Marty, if you want to be like Jesus... If you want to be like Jesus, stop judging the world and start saving the world by pointing people towards Jesus. You see, here's what I think. I think if most of us as followers of Christ were more focused on pointing people towards Jesus and less focused on judging others, we, we really wouldn't have time to be judgmental of other people. Uh, we would be spending time trying to figure out how to share our faith and how to walk with them and the difficulties that they're going through and, and how they are, are struggling in their own life personally. You see, every time I judge someone, I can't be like Christ. In fact, Satan is the accuser of the believer. The Bible tells us that over and over again. And every time I am being judgmental, I basically uh, find myself being exactly like Satan. He's the accuser of those of us who are followers of Jesus. We don't need to judge and to accuse one another. You see, in Christ, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, there is no condemnation. And it's important to understand that when you accuse others, you are doing Satan's job for him. You are actually making it more difficult for believers to be able to live out their life and their faith in the way that God wants us to live out our life and our faith. So here's the last question we're going to answer. How can I learn to be less judgmental? And, and maybe you're sitting here today and you're going, this really doesn't apply to me. Can I tell you something? It applies to all of us. Because everybody that I've ever met in conversations that we have, I have found that all of us, myself included, can be very judgmental. Let me just give you an illustration. This week, Angela and I were driving to a meeting. We were actually probably going to be way ahead of time. I, I, I really try to be on time or ahead of time. We're riding down the road, and there's this person in front of us. Uh, I hope it wasn't nobody in this room, but maybe when you leave today, you may say, Pastor Marty, that was me. Well, I was judging you. And I had a lot of things to say about you as we were riding down the road. I was telling Angela, I said, you know, they think it's Sunday, and they can just take their time as they drive down the road. It was busy, you know, at, at 730 in the morning. And, and I'm thinking to myself, what in the world are they doing? I mean, I, I, I got all these judgment calls I'm making about both individuals in the car. And all of a sudden, we get up on Highway 231, and they turn in to the Cancer Institute. Man, 
did my attitude change? Man, did I make a really bad judgment call? I began to say to myself, they probably were driving slow because they've had a, they're probably having a really bad day. They're probably driving slow because their life has been turned upside down. They're probably driving slow because they don't feel good today. They're probably driving slow. I mean, all these things started going through my mind when my wife had cancer. I'm just remembering everything that she went through. And I'm thinking, how judgmental of you. You know, so I stand before you today to say, I don't get it right every single time, but I want to. I want to be different. And the only way that I can be different is to learn how to be less judgmental. So in the next five minutes, let me talk to you about that just for a second. I'm going to give you four things that we can do. The first one is this. If you're going to learn to be less judgmental, the first thing that you've got to do is you have to remember, I never know anyone's motivation. I never know anyone's motivation. You see, if you could just keep that in front of you consistently, anytime we make a judgment, we're assuming we know someone's motivation. We're assuming we know something about them. It's dumb to judge someone's motives when you don't know your own motives. I mean, I don't even know my own motives. I can't even judge my own heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, from the Living Bible translation, listen to what it says. No one can really know what anyone else is thinking or what he is really like except that person himself. It's saying you, you don't know the other person's motives. You, you don't know what's behind their thinking. So I should not judge because there's no way for me to know your motivation or what you're trying to do. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, in the NIV, listen to what he says. Therefore, judge no one before the appointed time. He's saying there's a time that, that everyone's going to be judged. That time will what? Wait till the Lord returns. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness, and he will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive the right praise from God. He says, God is the ultimate judge. God knows our motives and he will judge them accordingly. He's the only one that knows our motives. And so he'll give us the right judgment. He says, remember, you don't know all the facts. You don't know the story. You don't know the motives. You may tell yourself a story. You may try to assume the facts. But oftentimes you don't know. And he says, therefore, you don't need to judge because you don't even know your own motives. But then secondly, the second thing we have to do is remember that I have blind spots that I can't see. You see, I have blind spots and you have blind spots. You know what's interesting to me about blind spots? I can see your blind spots, but I can't see mine. That's why they're called blind spots. See, you can't see yours, but I can see yours. And it's interesting to me that, that we all have blind spots, which means that we need each other because we can help each other. We have blind spots in our lives, and that's, they're, they're called blind spots for a reason. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 and 5, listen to what Jesus said. He said, why are you so concerned about a speck of sawdust in someone else's eye when you have a huge log in your own eye? How dare you say, let me get that speck out of your eye? And then he says, instead, judge yourself and first remove the log in your own eyes so you can see clearly to help others. It's interesting because those that were followers of Jesus in that day, the disciples who would have been closest to Jesus, he's actually using sarcasm here. He's, he's actually, they would have laughed at this when Jesus said this. You see, we tend to judge others in what we dis, I'm sorry, we tend to judge in others what we dislike in ourselves. I want you to think about that just for a second. See, it's easy for me to look at someone and go, man, you know what? They're just lazy. You know what it means? It's probably because I'm lazy. And so it's easy for me to see it in somebody else to say, man, that person is just lazy. It's easy for me to say, man, look at him. He's just full of pride. When in reality, I'm the one that's full of pride. The reason I can see it in others is because it's in me. You see, our own sins and our own weaknesses, we have to evaluate them. That's what the Bible calls us to do. If we seriously want to change our hearts and our lives, we constantly have to be saying, hey, what are my blind spots? What, what are my own sins and my own failures and my own problems and my own struggles? I need to work on those God does not want me to judge others, but he wants me to judge myself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, listen to what it says. If we judge ourselves in the right way, God would not judge us. 
It says if we would look at our own sins and failures and faults and begin to deal with them and work on them and do things to change them inside of us rather than pointing them out in other people, God wouldn't judge us. He says, so work on your own problems, your own struggles, your own sins. Be focused on those things. So remember that I have blind spots that I can't see. There are things in my life that I can't see. That's why I need my wife and my children and my friends and other staff members around me that can help me to see those things so that I can work on them. I can work on them and make myself a different person. Then number three, it says, remember, I'll be judged by the same standard I use. This one has always scared me to death. I mean, it does. See, the standard that I use to judge you is the same standard that I will be judged by. And that just makes me go, man, I I don't want to be judged by that standard. You see, I got to be careful because whatever standard I use to judge you, God is going to use that same standard to judge me in my life. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, Jesus said it this way. He said, do not, um, do not judge others or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, you will be measured. He tells us whatever standard we use or whatever measurement we use to judge others, that's the one that God is going to use to judge you and to judge me. And man, every time I think about, like when I, when I become judgmental with somebody, when I catch myself in a moment trying to, to make a judgment call about them, I, I immediately remind myself, hey, in the same way that you're judging them, God is going to judge you. By the measure you use, God also will use that measure in your life. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10, 12, and 13, listen to what it says. You have no right to criticize your brother or to look down on him. Remember, each of us will stand personally before the judgment seat of God. So it's saying there's going to be a time and a day that we'll stand before God and we'll give an account of our life. And then it goes on. Yes, each of us will have to give an account of himself to God. So then don't criticize each other anymore. Why? Because I'll be judged by the standard that I use. Number four, the last one. Remember how God has shown me grace. Remember how God has shown me grace. You know what I find? I find what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. He who has been forgiven little loves little, but he who has been forgiven much loves much. It's the idea of grace. When you really begin to understand how horrible of a sinner you really are, when you really begin to see yourself truly for the person that you are before God, you become a person of grace because you realize that God and his grace loved you anyways, that he forgave you, and that in the way that he's forgiven you, you also should forgive others and show grace to them. You see, let me just tell you something about Pastor Marty. If I got what I deserved, I wouldn't be standing here today. If I got what I served, I wouldn't breathe the next breath that I'm about to breathe. It's only by God's grace that I'm able to experience and know his love. In fact, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 and 8, it says it this way. It says, it is by free grace that you have been saved and delivered from judgment through your faith. And this salvation is not of your own doing. It is of God or it is God's gift to you. You see, God gave us a gift And the gift that God gave to us was his son, Jesus. I think the easiest way for me to illustrate this, and let's see if I can do this without messing this whole thing up. Um, The easiest way for me to illustrate this is just simply to draw it for you. And um, I'm going to draw this, and hopefully you'll be able to understand it. You see, if you and I look out into the world today, we see that we live in a broken world. I mean, it's very easy. I think all of us would agree. Uh, we're um, um, We're not united We find ourselves struggling and battling with each other. There's sickness and death, heartache and pain that is all around us. The world is broken, but that's not the way that God intended it. You see, in the very beginning, God, out of his incredible love, created this world because he wanted to have a relationship with us. And what the Bible tells us is that we all uh, sinned and we went our own way, the very first people, Adam and Eve. And you see, the Bible called this direction that they took sin. And ever since then, man has lived in brokenness. And when we live in brokenness, we try to do all kinds of things in order to make ourselves feel better. We'll seek possessions. We'll seek power. We'll seek prestige. We'll seek relationships. We do everything we can, but all those things only lead back to brokenness. What this passage of Scripture teaches us 
is that God, out of his incredible love for us, sent his son, Jesus. He came into the world and lived the sinless, perfect life that you and I would never be able to live. And then he died on a cross and he was resurrected so that you and I could have a relationship with God. Not in brokenness, but that if we were willing to leave brokenness and put our faith and trust in what Jesus did, we could be reunited with God in a new relationship. The question that I want to ask you this morning as we close is where are you? Are you in perfect harmony and relationship with God because of your relationship with his son? Or do you find yourself still living in brokenness? And you're trying everything you can to try to make it right, but none of it is working out for you. You see, the reason that you and I need grace, the reason that we need God's love, is because it allows us to be a person of grace and to love others. So where are you at this morning? Are you a person that is living in brokenness? Are you a person that has accepted God's love to his son Jesus and you're in right relationship with him and the brokenness in your world has been taken care of because of what Christ has done for you? Today, I pray that you'll leave here experiencing his grace. I'm going to ask you if you would to pray with me. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Marty, I'm living in brokenness, I want to change that for you right now. I want to give you an opportunity to put your faith and your trust in Christ. You see, the Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For it's with the mouth that man confesses and it's in his heart that he believes. The only thing that you have to do is believe that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. That he lived a sinless, perfect life, died on the cross was buried and then resurrected so that you could be right and made right with God. And so today, right now, you can just simply pray a simple prayer, something like this in your heart. Just mean these words to God. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. And I know that I live in a broken world. And I have tried everything that I can to try to fix that brokenness. And today I realize that that only comes through a relationship with your son, Jesus. So Heavenly Father, I put my faith and my trust in Christ. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to heal the brokenness in my life, to make me whole again. Please come in and be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Thank you, God, for loving me. And thank you, Jesus. For saving me with every head bowed every eye closed and no one looking around if you just prayed that prayer the greatest decision of your life and I want to pray for you as we close the service today I'm going to ask you to do something very brave very bold nobody looking around if you just prayed that prayer would you raise your hand so that I could pray for you there you go God bless you 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 thank you so much And those of you that are at campuses, we see your hands. For those that are online, you can just click right there on the hand, and that way we'll know that you made that decision. Father, we rejoice in the decisions that have been made today to step into your grace. God, help us to be a people as we live in this world, to not be judgmental of others. But help us to be an instrument of grace. Remind us that every time we judge others, we're playing God. And I pray that we wouldn't live that way this week, that God, we would walk out of here changed from the inside, wanting to be different, to be an instrument of grace to the people that are around us. When others are judging, may we be loving, may we be kind, may we give grace, may we give mercy. And may people see in us something they don't see in others. And by that, may they choose and say, I want to be a follower of Jesus because they are so, so different. And so, God, we thank you for the words of James. Use them to encourage and inspire us this week as we live out our lives. Because we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. North Star, let's put our hands together and celebrate all those who committed their life to Christ.